another frequent flyer and guest favorite, Michael Batiste with the Elk Calling Academy. Here we go. There exists a threat from anti-hunting groups to politicians trying to give our land away, and we won't stand for it. Those vast western landscapes provide the space for our wildlife to thrive and a place for hunters and anglers to fuel the fire that sparks their soul. In this show, we share our love of hunting, fishing, and conservation. Here, we provide the foundation to meet these threats through passion and the grit of the American outdoorsman. Welcome to the Western Huntsman Podcast. Welcome, this is Jim Huntsman, the host of the Western Huntsman Podcast, coming at you from the Broken Time Studio in Hayden, Idaho. Thank you guys for tuning in. Uh, great to be with you. Glad you guys are here. Um, I just want to, uh, I, I do this every few episodes, but I, I, I do want to send a special thank you to, to you guys, the listeners out there. Um, you guys you guys are fantastic. I love the interaction uh, that, that we're getting kind of, uh, outside of the show, you know, through people emailing and sending messages and stuff like that. How bitching is that? I love it. So, uh, thank you guys for that. Thanks for being involved, uh, to you new listeners out there. Welcome to the Western Huntsman. The Western Huntsman podcast is a show where we, we discuss all things hunting in an effort to kind of build enthusiast, enthusiasm, uh, in an effort to protect our outdoors, our public lands, our wildlife, uh, hunting the, the the lifestyle that is hunting and uh, this is this is a, a movement uh, for everybody out there if you're if you're on social media check us out on Instagram and Facebook uh, and uh, use the hashtag team Western Huntsman uh, that thing's been moving and rolling right along so I appreciate you guys that are that are doing that uh, in this episode I've got a like I said in the very beginning a frequent flyer Mr. Michael Batiste and he's backed by uh, popular demand. Um, I've had several messages to get him back on the show to talk elk hunting, and and uh, what we're talking about today is setting goals as a hunter. Um, you, you know, not not like in one of those dorky motivational ways that you hear uh, a, a lot on on a lot of different types of shows that are out there. Uh, it, this is going to be specific to hunting. You know how how do you how do you set a goal and then kind of reverse engineer that goal to uh, make it become a reality. And, and I think that that's, that's an important thing that, uh, and I think that's a thing that a, a lot of hunters out there that, uh, you know, complain about, you know, how overcrowded their unit is or the wolves killing all the wildlife or, um, you, you know, which I'm guilty of, um, you know, different reasons and, and, and scenarios or excuses, if you will, as to why they didn't tag out. And I think that a lot of that boils down to a lack of planning and a lack of foresight into the future. So we're sitting in January. You might be listening to this. I don't know. It might be July by the time you're listening to this. But if you're listening to it as as it comes out, as these shows come out, you know, we're sitting at the very end of January. Hunting season is going to be here before we know it. And we could be talking about turkey, spring turkey here in a couple months or spring bear in a couple months. Or we could be talking about September archery or um, you know, October rifle hunting or late season in November, all those hunts are, you know, they're just, especially as you get older, you guys in your twenties might not realize this, but as you get older, the, the time from January to hunting season seems to shrink. Like it's all of a sudden on top of you. And it's, uh, it's alarming <laughs> how fast life comes at you at, uh, at a certain point. I don't know what, what that magic number is, uh, or age point or whatever, but, um, kind of scares me sometimes, man. (laughs) So anyways, the point being, these seasons are going to be here before we know it. And, uh, hopefully if you, if you don't do this, hopefully some of you will get something out of this particular conversation in regards to how to set a goal, reverse engineer that goal to get to the point of notching a tag. And, uh, the, the concepts that we talk about in this episode really are specific to hunting. You know, what, what does it take um, uh, th- there's more to a goal than just saying, I want to kill a bull elk. 
And uh, okay, so how are we going to achieve that? And and that is what we break down in this episode, and it's really good. It's uh, uh, Michael is a is a perfect guy to have on for this because he talks a lot about that within the Elk Calling Academy, uh, and and this is just a, a great back and forth exchange on that on that topic. So before we get into that, um, real quick, we have a trivia question on this episode, and it's it's kind of cheating because if if you're a um, you know, consistent listener of the Western Huntsman podcast, you're going to know this already if you've been listening for a few months. But um, if you're if you're a new listener, you're going to have to find this information somehow. So, and just so if, for for those of you that don't know, our trivia questions come out every every couple of three maybe episodes or so. Um, and and those of you that write in and answer those trivia questions, right or wrong, not that I'm into giving everybody a trophy for nothing, but um, there's, there's a reason, there's a method to my madness with this. If you write in right or wrong answer, uh, answering these, these trivia questions, uh, I enter you into a pool that, uh, about once a quarter, I do a drawing on all those names and somebody is going to win some cool prizes. And, and this quarter, uh, we're going to have some Phelps gear, uh, to give away to you now. The 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 one thing actually I'll circle back to that. So that that is that is the point with the trivia questions. Um, or, or you know the goal is to get you entered into the drawing and and hopefully you win some gear and and uh, it's gonna like I said it's gonna be some Phelps stuff, some Western Huntsman stuff, um, just a cool prize package and then we'll we'll start it all over and start the trivia questions all over after that. So this in this episode. The, this is going to be on mule deer, even though most of this episode with Michael is, you know, we're talking mainly elk, but uh, we're going to talk mule deer for just a minute. Have you ever been hunting? It's it's early in the morning. You make your way over a, a, a ridge and it's maybe covered in sagebrush and there's a slight breeze and all of a sudden you see something bounding away, right? And uh, if if you're like me, sometimes in the sage you mistake it initially as like a jackrabbit but it's not it's the butt of a mule deer and they're bright white you know what i'm talking about uh it's how you can uh, that's how i always spot mule deers is is i could i could see the white butt um they're not exactly running and they're like hopping like a rabbit they're hopping uh, that's that's really the best way white tail do not do it other deer species don't do this but mule deer do this thing where they're getting away and they're hopping. And it's it's something else to see. It's uh, it's an interesting movement of a wild game species that <clears throat> you just don't really see with anything else. And I, I always enjoy seeing that. And it's kind of a, you know, if you're hunting mule deer, it could be, um, you know, put that, get, get that pit of your stomach, you know, pretty sour pretty quick because it means they're they're out of here. Uh, but they're they're getting away. They could hop over logs, tall sage, you know, deadfall, uh, all that kind of stuff. What is that hop called? What is that hop called? Mule deer. They're getting away and they're like hopping, almost. It looks like a rabbit or something, uh, but more exaggerated. What is that hop called? We've talked about it on this show. And so get back to me with your answers. Write them in at jim at the western huntsman dot com. That is uh, the email address uh, to send it to, jim at thewesternhuntsman.com, and I will take all those email answers, and we'll have the answer for you next week, uh, And uh, but I'll, I'll put all those names into the drawing. The last thing, before we transition to getting Michael on, the uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to talk about real quick something like 20 years ago, uh, in terms of calling elk, what, what the, there was this thing where these new calls would come out, right? And, and it was always like, oh, this one makes the perfect tone and calls in elk. It's called the, you know, blah, 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 what, whatever name would be really a, a really good kind of marketing gimmick kind of thing. And everybody was kind of in search for that perfect call uh, that makes the right sound that the animals really respond to. And I, I've, I've kind of been noticing that there's some people that, that still look at that as if that is, uh, you know, an applicable thing to focus on when you're looking at um, getting an elk call. Let's uh, I, you need to change your mindset on that because that's that's not it doesn't matter exactly what the tone is when you're calling elk, okay? Um, the the hoochie mama versus the terminator kind of stuff. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Um, those those kind of calls 
it, it, it you're not looking for what kind of tone the call will make for you. You're looking for what kind of tone you can make with the call. Does that make sense? So reverse that that thought. It's not about this uh, this read does better than this read because it just sounds better. No. Find the read that works best in your mouth and and your airway and and what you can personally do with it and then make the elk sounds from there because it's not about the tone. All elk, they all have little different tones and nuances and we talk a lot about this in, in this upcoming episode with Michael but um, I, I did want to touch on that. Don't, don't look for some magic... Um, formula in in a specific call that is going to perk the ears of every bull elk on the mountain that's not how that works it is knowing which call is best suited for your mouth and your palate and 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 all that kind of stuff and how you use it and then on top of that how you use it is super important knowing why you're going to make that call and that sound at that particular time uh, how the animal's going to respond, how you respond to the responding animal, all those things, that's what you've got to know. So don't focus so much. If if you go to like phelpsgamecalls.com and, and you're looking at those different read, uh, those, those diaphragm reads, try a couple of them. Um, use promo code Huntsman10 because uh, it'll save you 10% off. I'm, and and uh, obviously this ad aside, um, just pick some that you think are going to work best in your mouth, try a few different calls out and you're going to find one or two that are kind of, they're, they're just going to work better for you. And that's what you work with. And that's what you build upon. It does not matter the specific tone quality of each particular read. That's not the application. And, and this is just, you know, it's more, uh, mostly my opinion, but I think a lot of great elk hunters would agree with that. It's what you can do and how you know how to use those calls that is important. So, don't fall for any of those uh, goofy, you know, marketing tricks or ploys or anything like that. With that said, hopefully that helps, guys. Uh, just a little clarifier, especially for you new hunters and 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 folks looking to get into uh, calling elk this year. Um, hopefully that uh, that little tidbit helps you out a little bit. All right, let's get after it with Michael Batiste from the Elk Calling Academy. Thank you guys so much for tuning in in and enjoy this episode. Here we go. Click on anything, I promise. <laughs> Don't touch the controls. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Hey, uh, I think I. Th- oh no, I'm already recording. We're set. Cool. Hey guys, welcome to uh, the next episode of the Western Huntsman Podcast. I've got a um, a frequent flyer for this episode, <laughs> Mr. Michael Batiste of the Elk Calling Academy. How you doing, brother? I am doing exceptionally well. How are you doing, brother? Man, if I was any better, I don't I don't even know what I'd be able to tell you at this point. Um, other than I forgot to turn the heat on in the studio here and it's freezing. You know, that's just climate and acclimation. So it's mm-hmm. uh, you know, getting getting you ready for late season hunts and fishing trips and that kind of stuff. That's right. I'm uh, building my uh I'm building up my stamina, man. There you go. There you go. So you can go out on the ice and go ice ice fishing. <laughs> None of our lakes have even frozen yet, so uh, that's. I don't think. I don't know if that's going to happen this year. Oh, but, that's okay. Uh, so this uh, this episode, guys, what we're going to be talking about is uh, hunting goals, setting goals, uh, and and kind of you know t- having the discussion of how to how to achieve those goals and and set realistic goals in 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 terms of hunting that you guys can achieve and 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 like roadmap out because. Uh, Michael and I were talking before we we hit record, and and kind of what I was saying is I I feel like a lot of people they know how to set a goal, but they not maybe have never really been taught how to achieve a goal. Uh, and and when we're talking about it being hunting specific, uh, I can't think of a better guy to talk to on this topic than Michael. So, um, <laughs> and I guess before it, let's I I do have a lot of new listeners, Michael. So in case they haven't 
heard you on the show before or they're living on a different planet and have never heard of you, uh, give us give us a quick bird's eye view of who you are and, and uh, tell us a little bit about the Elk Calling Academy and we'll take it from there. Sure. So my name is Michael Batiste. Uh, I grew up in Oregon um, and that's actually where my hunting teeth got cut or chiseled, I guess you could say, was you know, high school, you know, bird hunting and, and whatnot with friends and, and my stepdad. And um, then when I moved to college there in La Grande, it progressed into big game hunting. Um, and then I moved over to Idaho kind of early 90s, mid 90s. And then that's when I really got into uh, elk hunting and just really became fascinated about their behaviors and vocalizations and, you know, what they did, why they did and all that kind of stuff and really dove into paying attention and learning. Um, God, pushing 20 years ago, I got involved in the outdoor and hunting industry as, as pro staff for a few companies and kind of worked my way up and became pro staff directors and kind of right hand man for a few of those. And, and then three years ago started the Elk Calling Academy uh, which the Elk Calling Academy is designed to basically shorten the learning curve. You know, take, uh, you know, I, I first started elk hunting in 1988. And so the Elk Calling Academy is, is basically a place where people can go and learn from the mistakes that I learned over those years and still learn. I mean, we're, it's, it's constantly evolving and learning, but it's to shorten that learning curve so that they can find consistent success faster. Um, you know, yeah. and it goes through all aspects of, of calling, you know, how to become a proficient caller, goes through all the vocalizations of what they mean and how to do them and call strategies and e-scouting and articles on, you know, shooting and, and equipment. And I also have yeah. another, you know, I also have another company that's, you know, Sawtooth Outdoor Supply that's kind of sat on the back burner for a little bit and kind of overshadowed by Elk Calling Academy. And that's one of the things I decided for 2021 is I'm going to pull that out into, you know, the spotlight with Elk Calling Academy because they kind of go hand in hand with um, the gear. And, and yeah. I mean, Saw, Sawtooth Outdoor Supply has, I mean, camping, hunting, fishing, survival. I mean, you know, all all kinds of gear. And, and so they kind of, you know, tie together. But yeah. So Elk Calling Academy, there's a couple of different ways. There's there's an e-course that can go to elkcallingacademy.com. It is on a Patreon page right now. Um, but later this spring will be, um, you know, later this this spring, it'll actually, you know, transition over onto our own website. And have oh, a full cool. blown, yeah, full blown, full blown e-course revamping all of the, the, the videos with kind of some new ways of, of, of doing that. And, and I'm going to kind of keep the bat, the cat in the bag a little bit on kind of what we have coming with that. But there's that. And then also do one on one lessons. Um, and that's the mm -hmm. wonderful thing about technology with Zoom is, you know, anybody can be in the comfort of their own home and can do one on one face to face calling lessons. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for those, uh, for my peeps up here in North Idaho, uh, Michael's the guy that we had come up a couple of years ago for the seminar. And, uh, we are, we're going to do it again. If this stupid virus ever goes away, <laughs> no kidding. And like, God, I'm, I'm over it. I don't know about you guys, but, um, I'm over it. <laughs> and so, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, so you do you do seminars, you do one on one lessons. You've got the Elk Calling Academy on Patreon, uh, soon, soon to be on your own website, and then the Sawtooth Outdoor Supply Company, um, which I'll link all that in the show notes uh, for those of you guys listening. And uh, it, this is just a another uh, resource uh, that that we talk about on this show a lot. That like there is no excuse. It is it is January. There is no excuse to go into September this year. And not know how to call elk, not know how to respond to elk vocal, vocalizations, not have some strategies in mind, not be in shape for it. There, there's no excuse right now uh, because we've got a fresh plate. And, and that's why it's a perfect time of year for you and I to have this discussion uh, about goals. And, and the Elk Calling Academy is a great resource for uh, those of you that, that are, are looking – for these resources to get you geared up for this season. I mean, it's going to be here before we know it. I, I, I did the math today. It's like 
we're, we're a little bit north of eight months out and eight months, especially when you get, uh, you know, you start hitting these, these age numbers that you and I are in, um, eight months is nothing, man. Oh, absolutely. Well, and, and, and the thing too is, you know, you really think about it. We're locked in winter right now and yeah, it's been a mild winter, but you know, most winters we can't even get up into the hills until mid May. Yeah. You know, for, yeah, for exactly. June. And, and, and so then if you really think about it, you only have June, July and August, a three month window to get out there and really scout and set trail cameras and explore new territory. So. Yeah. Once you think of that aspect and, you know, as soon as you hit that and you're out there exploring those things, how much faster that time goes by. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it's crazy. Uh, it just like it's I always look at it, you, you know, when you're on the, the roller coaster and it's going up mm-hmm. the first hill and it's real slow. And then, the, you know, that first car on the roller coaster starts going over and they're still going slow. But then all of a sudden it's like June hits and that's when the tail end of the roller coaster hits that hill and everything just starts moving fast. Um, and yep. it's here before you know it. That's how I always describe it to people. No, that, and that's a great explanation with, of it. And I, I like that. And, you know, to kind of take that a step further, you mentioned here we are in January. You know, we're only 21 days into the month. So that means 21 days ago, how many people sat down and wrote down their New Year's resolutions? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to I'm going to lose X number of pounds. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And, um, you know, they set those goals for that for the year. Yeah, but I think yeah. but I think I think where a lot of people fail is that's great that they sit down and map out those or, or write down those goals. But they don't map out a way to achieve those goals. They don't have checkpoints along the way. And that's why a lot of New Year's resolutions go by the wayside. Yeah, they fail because of that, for sure. You know what you did recently? You you posted uh, that book by David Goggins, uh, "Can't Hurt Me." Yep. And and so uh, so I went. I I I saw your post, and so I jumped on Audible and I I downloaded it. I got it. Uh And holy shit, man, that book is crazy. (laughs) I mean, that book is nuts. Everybody should listen. Uh, They should they either buy the book, but I like the Audible version. I don't know which one you have, but. I like the audible because there's extra commentary and like they have uh-huh. discussions and challenges in it and, and he fills yep. you in, but that dude had a crazy childhood and I, I don't oh, want to give too much just, away. Just wait, yeah, just wait. Cause when you get later in the book and some things that come up, you're just going to shake your head about the things that he was able to accomplish. But yeah, you know, that's, that's yeah. one of those things that, that, that mental strength, that mental fortitude, mm-hmm. that, you know, we can look at people like David Goggins and go, this person is unworldly. I, I, I mean, the way they can do the things that they do. And, and a lot of people are like, there's, there's, there's a lot of people are like, there's no way that I can do that. In fact, my girlfriend and I were talking about this last or, or earlier today because um, the guys that I hunt with, you know, they call me one more ridge. So <laughs> just because, you know, there's a lot of times when we're out there, I'm like, let's just go one more ridge. Let's just go one more ridge. And that's that mental fortitude. That's that mental strength that basically I'm coaching them through, you know, getting through. And and, and it's basically it's it's that mindset of embrace the suck. Just like yeah. if you're on a if you're on a nasty pack out. I mean, you've got, you know, your packs weighted down. You have this elk on your back. You've got three miles to go and you've got all this elevation that you've got to climb up and drop down. Now you have two choices. You can either focus on the pain and focus on the hurt and focus how hard it is, or you can pay attention to how far you've come. You know, oh man. I like you know, that. Yeah. It's just like that. I'm only, I, I'm already halfway up the mountain, man. The top's right there. Then as soon as I get to the top, man, it's just downhill from there. I've got this and, 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 and it's, it's, it's all in that mindset and how you think when you're in that situation and how many times have you been there that you've been in the middle of that pack out and in your mind, you're like, this sucks. This is the worst pack out I have ever been on. I am going to die. And then you mm-hmm. get to the truck, you drop the tailgate, you sit on it, you drop that pack off. And five minutes later, you're like, that really wasn't that bad. Yeah, that's an amazing part of it. Like you, you, you just think you're gonna, you just think you're gonna kill over, and then as soon as you get back to the truck and you start thinking back 
Uh, it's the same like if you're on a long drive and while you're on that long 10 hour drive halfway through, you're like, oh, my God, this thing's never going to end. Then you get there and it's like, oh, that wasn't that bad. Same thing with a with with what you're talking about. And uh, I really like that mentality. And and what I would say to to people listening to this um when, especially if you're like a new hunter and, and you haven't been out on the uh, grinding through the mountains of, of the West, you know, chasing an elk. Um, it, one thing I learned when, when I was in the, in, in the military, like you can go a lot further than you give yourself credit for. It, exactly. it is amazing what your body can do. I remember we, we had this training in the Marines and I, I want to, I want to say it was called like the Mu X or something like it was some crazy training where you had to, we had to hike out 30 miles, right. To get to the beach. Mm-hmm. And then all this other training started after that. And, you know, 30 miles is, is, is just hell. I mean, it's, it's like hell. Uh, and, and I remember, I remember thinking we're, we're, we're hiking along. We've got all this gear on weighted down. My, my feet are already blistered up. And I remember thinking, God, man, we got to be getting close. We've got to be getting close at this point. And, uh, all of a sudden, I think it was like the, the company first sergeant or something. He's like, all right, Marines, we're, we're halfway there. And I, I, it like, so it deflated me. I, I, mm-hmm. and I, I remember thinking at that point there, I cannot this, if this is halfway, I, there's no way I can make this. I, I just, I, mm-hmm. I can't make, I'm going to, I'm going to die. I'm going to fall over and, and just die. They're going to like, you know, give me full honor burial and, and, and it's going to be over. Uh, but next thing I know we're there that yep. we, we made that, we'd made that the longest hike I've ever done in my life. And, and mm-hmm. I, and then like, I'm sitting there and my feet are killing me. But I, I remember thinking, uh, I just did that and I achieved this. And as a team, we achieved this together. And you know what? It wasn't that bad. And so right. I think that just goes to highlight what your point is. And, and I want to talk to the audience in that sense that, you know, th- you can go a lot further than you, wh- what you give yourself credit for and a lot of, uh, you know, and, and this is for people that may not have tested that kind of uh, mental toughness in the past uh, is right. doable. And it, so it is. And, oh, and, and yeah, it's, it's, it's all in what you focus on. You know, you can, you can either focus on how far you have left to go, or you can sit there and focus on, man, with each step I take, I get farther away from where I started and closer to where I'm going to finish. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Great point. So can you walk us through Michael, like in walk us through what your goals hunting wise are, for this year. And then maybe we can, maybe, I don't know, reverse engineer them or something to, to, so we can, we can find out how you're going to get there. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So, so one of the goals that I always have going in each year is learning more about the area that I'm hunting and it's, it's, it's wanting to expand. And, and so one of the things that I've already done is, you know, I pulled up on X and all of my e-scouting tools and picked locations that I want to go into, that I want to expand the area that we can hunt. I want to take a look at these areas. And so now knowing this, like one of the spots, it's, I, I know exactly, you know, you know what we need to do. It's, it's basically park one truck at the end of the trail and then we'll drive another truck to the start of the trail and we'll hike that through. And I know exactly it is 9.75 miles from vehicle to vehicle. Mm-hmm. With, within that, we are going to gain 1,200 feet in elevation before we get to the top. And then on the backside, we will drop just over 900. So by knowing that, I know the first 6.2 miles of that hike, we are going to gain 1,200 feet in elevation, which doesn't sound like much. The only problem is, is that 1,200 feet is in the last 1.2 miles. So, oh, geez. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's a lot, man. <laughs> it, it is. It is. And, and so, so basically what I've done is now I've taken that and I've broken it down into chunks. I've, I've broken it down into manageable pieces. And so I, I've already, you, you know, and I've, I've told my hunting partners, we're doing this hike on the first camping trip we get up there. And of course, the look on their face and I'm like, you have two choices. You can either take time now during the winter to get yourself in shape a little bit so that we can do this hike or it's going to just be trial by fire by, with you guys. And you're going to get in shape on the hike because I'm going to drag you with me kicking or screaming. It doesn't matter. 
but <laughs> so, but by breaking it down and, and so by breaking it down, so what I've done is I've taken this whole hike and I've broken it down into sections that I want to explore and I'm giving us all day to do this hike. So, you know, let's just call it 10 miles, 10 miles in a full day is not bad at all to do. Yeah. So by breaking it down into, into sections, what it does, it kind of forces you to slow down and be aware of your surroundings while you're going, because that's where I'm hiking through and I'm looking for rutting sign. I'm looking for wallows. I'm looking for rubs. I'm looking for game trails. I'm looking for signs that there are animals there. And so now by breaking it into these sections, now I definitely know how far those sections. Then what I'll do when we go to hike it is even though we're going to take it as an at an easy pace, I'm going to track how long it takes me to hit each of those milestones. Mm -hmm. So that way, depending on where we find the sign in that, then I know, okay, you know, there was really good sign at the 3.5 mile mark. Yeah. And when we were yeah. going easy, it, when we were going easy, it took us this amount of time to get in there. So, Let me ask you something, Michael, just on, on kind of a side note, something you brought up there. Uh, within the Elk Calling Academy, do you do like private one-on-one -on -one lessons as to how to e-scout? Is that available? So there's actually tutorial videos on my e-scouting tools that I use. And there's and, and, and what I did was I did e-scouting challenges. That what I did was I threw out GPS coordinates. So yeah, I remember when you were doing that, yeah. Yeah, so that way the students could use the tools that I taught them and then they can go on those GPS coordinates and then they can scout the area. And I would give them two weeks to scout it. And then I would come in and I would basically just record screen share and I would scout that area using the tools and point out, this is what I'm looking at. This area interests me because of this. This area interests me because of that. Okay, this has enough interest that I want to come in and hike this during the summer. Now, if I was going to hunt this, this is how I would access it in the mornings because of the way thermals are. This is where I would camp. This would be my route in. This is how I would hunt it. This is where I would be midday. This is where I'd be in the evening time. And this is how I would come out. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So, so that, but that's, that's available there. I was just curious if you did yep. like, uh, you know, like that, like just a one-on-one -on -one session with that. And, and, but if that's yeah, available, have. it sounds, sounds like that, that, that pretty much cover it. Well, no. And I have done one-on-one -on -one with people to where they said, you know, they've, they've booked a lesson because lessons are an hour long and it's basically whatever you want. And yeah, I've had some students go, Hey, I want to book a lesson and I want you to e-scout my hunting area. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, Huh. So, okay. You've got, you've got your 10 mile hike and, and you break that yep. down into milestones. So like the first yep. 3.2 miles is, is fairly, uh, I wouldn't say flat. I mean, this is Idaho, but, uh, the, yes. the real incline, uh, starts, you know, uh, within somewhere in that mile three or, or maybe it was mile six, you said. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, toward, it's towards the tail end of it. And so the, but one of the, one of the key aspects uh, to, to what you're talking about is you're, you're setting these milestones. So each one, as you're going through it, that's your focus, right? You're not like, right. man, I'm only a mile into a 10 mile hike. I still have nine miles to go. It's more like, okay, in three miles, uh, I'm going to hit this, this spot and we're going to, we're going to kind of reevaluate. Uh, and now that's only two miles left. And now that's only one mile left. And then it's like, it's like kind of that saying, how do you eat a, a, an elephant, you know, one bite at a time. It does kind of trigger more of this emotional acceptance that people can, can, can have. And it's like, it, it's just easier to, to take in. Does that make sense? Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, and, and, and yeah, so this is, this would be kind of one example, kind of what we talked about. So, so I have this goal that I want to do this whole hike through and I want to do it on the first camping trip, which I know is going to be end of May, beginning of June. So I know exactly when this is going to happen. So here's a couple of ways that people could look at this goal and do this goal is, is one. So I'm working out at home five or six days a week. So uh, I've got a bunch of resistance bands. I've got a workout app and, you know, work out five or six days a week with strength training and cardio because my plan is, is I want to do that full hike the first trip out. 
Now, somebody else, they may look at it and go, okay, I've got this, I, I've got this 10 mile section that I want to hike and explore. And I have all summer long to it, to explore this, check it mm-hmm. out. So, mm-hmm. so maybe their milestones is on the first camping trip. I'm going to scout the first three miles. And so they're going to go three miles in, they're going to check it, and they're going to come three miles out. Yeah. So, I mean, that that in itself is conditioning of the body and getting ready. And then, you know, they're like, okay, now I'm going to come back the next weekend and I'm going to go to mile five. And now, so now I'm going to go five miles in, five miles out. So, and eventually by breaking it up like that, by weekend four or five of it, they're going to be so far in that they're going to like, okay, you know what? I've reached the pinnacle. I've reached the peak. Everything is downhill from here. I'm just mm-hmm. going to go ahead and hike the rest of the way through. So it's breaking it into smaller chunks. Like you said, eating that elephant one bite at a time. But the key thing is, is each person has set those milestones of what they want to achieve and how they're going to achieve that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great explanation. I, I want to, I'm going to simplify this even further uh, in terms of, of goal setting. And then I want to get back to some of your other goals that you've, you've got for the year. But, but in, in a way to simplify this in, in uh, kind of an outside the hunting realm perspective, uh, in, in, in my day job in the past, one of, my, one of my capacities was I was an outside sales guy, right? And mm-hmm. I would set a goal. Okay, I want to sell this much so that I make this much money, right? Yep. And yep. and that's great. Every anybody can do that. Anybody can take a pen and write. Uh, here's my sales goal, right? Well, how do you get there? How do you get to that? So yep. what what I yep. what you have to do is you have to take the data that you have. Okay, I know that out of a uh, hundred bids I give, uh, I'm selling thirty five of those. So I'm I'm closing thirty five percent of this business, whatever. Um, and then so so what I need to do is I need to make a hundred phone calls that'll get me based on past data. That'll get me 20 appointments out of those 20 appointments. That's going to lead to 10 bids out of those 10 bids. That's going to get me three and a half or or three, maybe four sales, right? And at a certain average dollar amount, that's going to give me that particular income for that week. So what I'm trying to get at is, is that's how you break down a goal with a roadmap. It's not just yep. shooting from the hip and, and it's not just, you know, saying um, what I what I don't want people to get out of this is, is uh, say, oh, OK, they say we need to write down our goal. Uh, my goal this year is I'm going to shoot an elk with antlers. Mm-hmm. Um, cool. Mm-hmm. How, how are we going to get there now? How, how what mm-hmm. kind of how where are you hunting? What kind of physical uh, conditioning do you need? What kind of how much practice with your bow do you need? What kind of <laughs> gear do you need? What, you know, all these factors that go into it, how much time practicing elk calling am I going to need to do? Uh, How many times am I going to have to log on to to Michael's Patreon page and, and, and learn some elk calling strategies. Um, And that's literally that, that, that is the, like the missing piece to so many people's uh, puzzle that if, if they just did that and they, they actually focused on it and, and worked towards that knocking off and, and check marking those milestones success rates would be a lot higher. Am I off base? Oh, absolutely. No, yeah. you, you're exactly right. And and yeah, there's there's a lot of people that, you know, when I talk to them and, and that's exactly what they say, you know, when I'm like, hey, what's your goal for this fall? I want to kill my first elk. Great. How are you going to accomplish that? Yeah. How? Um, yeah. And, and so you're exactly right. So within, you know, punching that tag and getting your first elk, there's the ex- there's exactly the elements that you talked about. There's physical conditioning. There's proficiency with the equipment. There's calling. There's gear. There's nutrition. You know, all of that. And so you break those down into, in, into subcategories. Then with each of those subcategories, now you start setting your milestones or your goals for each of those. So, mm-hmm. you know, physical conditioning. How are you going to get there between now and then? Well, I'm going to work out minimum three days a week. Okay. What are you going to do for accountability? 
you know, how are you going to track how much you're working out? How are you going to track what your workouts are? How are you going to track your progress? Because if you're not writing these down and breaking them down into smaller, those, those smaller subcategories and then focusing on each subcategory. And then within those subcategories, if you don't have checkpoints or milestones or accountability, it's really, really easy to lose track. And then, like you said, it's August 15th and it's like season starts in two weeks. Yeah. I haven't worked out. I haven't picked up my calls. I barely mm-hmm. shot my bow. And so with each of those, yeah, the physical conditioning, I want to become more proficient with my bow. Okay. How are you going to do that? Um, you know, two nights a week, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot. Okay. Well, not just shoot narrow it down. You know what? I'm going to work on shooting on a two inch diameter dot from 40 yards. And I'm going to keep doing that until I can get five arrows in that two inch circle every stinking time from 40 yards. Mm -hmm. I like, see, that's, that's the technical breakdown that I'm talking about. That's fantastic. Yeah. The, the calling aspect of it, Um, you know, I can't use a diaphragm. But I'm going to go tap into resources to teach me how to use a diaphragm. And this is one thing that that I love when I talk to a lot of people. And they're like, that's great, but I don't have time to practice. You don't have time to practice. No, and I can't practice at home because my wife or this or that. I'm like, completely understandable. How far do you drive to work? Well, I have a 30-minute commute each way. So that's an hour a day. What do you do on that commute? while I listen to the radio and drink coffee, there is an hour a day right there uninterrupted in your vehicle by yourself that you're not annoying anybody that a person could be practicing their calling. And it's amazing (laughs) that, you know, it's amazing that if you did something like that for 21 days in a row. Oh, it'll change. It'll change everything. For, for an individual. And that, that reminds me, I, I got to bring up, if any of you are in Spokane, Washington, and uh, there was those, you know, Governor Inslee lockdown protests going on a few weeks back, the dude driving down the road, bugling out his window at you that everybody was looking at, that was me. Um, <laughs> I, I, it was like downtown Spokane. I ripped the gnarliest bugle. I'm cruising down. I'm, I've, I've, I've got to go, you know, for my day job, I'm, I'm down there for an appointment or whatever. And I, I let this big old bugle out of the truck and it like, it's echoing off the buildings. Everybody's out there protesting and they're all looking at my truck. It went silent. <laughs> so it was awesome. Perfect. But yeah, I no, love, that's, love that is a, that is a, that is a key point And, and what, what I tell people is, you know, when, when you're looking at, let's say we've got somebody listening that's never stuck a diaphragm in their mouth. They've never put a bugle yep. tube up in their face. And, and you know, they're looking at it. Well, I've only got eight months to September. Let me tell you something. If you start now, you could be a really good caller by, by September. And, and what, but that, oh, absolutely. that it takes repetition. It's just, it, this is like learning an instrument. And I, I remember when I, when I was learning the drums or guitar, uh, b- back in, back in my younger days, you know, I, I was spending an hour at least a day practicing those instruments. Now I'm not saying that's what you need to, to call elk. Uh, but you do need to spend, if you gave it 10 minutes a day for two weeks, yep. yeah, y- you'd be, you'd be blown away with how good you sound and record it. That's yep. another suggestion I always yep. give people, take your phone, put it on video mode or whatever, and, and record your bugles and then sit and listen back and, and kind of, you know, critique yourself. Cause you know what an elk's supposed to sound like, you, you know, you've all mm-hmm. heard them, you've all watched the videos and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so critique yourself. And, uh, it, it's just, it's mind boggling and that's how you, so, so I, I guess one way to put that, the direction we're both going with that is somebody saying, I want to be a proficient elk caller by the time right. September or October rolls around this year, you know, whether you're rifle hunting or, or bow hunting. Um, okay, let's break that down. For the next two weeks, every single day for 10 minutes a day, I'm going to practice my elk vocalizations. Then I'm going to break that down in, in, even further. The first two days are going to be strictly cow elk sounds. And then I'm going to work into bugles. And then I'm going to work into chuckles, you know, you know whatever. Uh, and then after that, just make set a goal like at least twice a week I'm putting a diaphragm in my mouth and I'm, I'm practicing for a minimum of 10 minutes 
And that's that's how you do it. Yeah. And even starting out with those two weeks, it's don't even worry about making, you know, elk sounds. It's I'm going to work on fundamentals. I'm going to work on getting a good seal. I'm going to work on, you know, getting good con- tongue contact and mm-hmm. that high to low and low to high drill that, you know, I teach in the academy are two great drills that, you know, if you did that for the first two weeks, like you talked about, so you have a 30 minute commute, you take 15 minutes each way and you just work on this high. To, so, so to work, heading to work, I'm going to work on the high to low for 15 minutes on the drive. On the way home, I'm going to switch it up and I'm going to do the low to high. And if somebody did that for two weeks straight, the fundamental aspect and the control that they would get is, is, is just, you know, tremendous. And, you know, it's something amazing. just popped in my And something popped into my head that, you know, we're sitting here talking about working out three days a week and I'm going to shoot my bow at least two days a week. And I can guarantee there's people that are sitting here listening to this right now that are going, that's all well and dandy, but I don't have time for that. I don't have time to do that stuff. I wish I could. And we're wired that way. But I can guarantee if you were to write down what you do throughout your day, you would find all kinds of time. And, mm-hmm. and, and I, I, I remember I was at the hunt expo last year. I was talking to, you know, somebody about this and they were like, I just don't have time to work out. And I said, okay. I said, do you have your phone on you? And he says, yeah. I said, what kind of phone is it? Well, I've got an iPhone. Great. Pull it out. Go to your screen time. What? Go to your screen time. And he pulls out his screen time and he was spending almost seven hours a day on his phone on social media. Jeez, man. Yeah, I'd go blind if I did that. Well, and I'm saying, like, and this is just one, this, this is just one example. And then there's, yeah. and, and then again, I'm sure there's people that are going to be listening to this going, well, I don't spend that much time on social media. Okay. Write down how much time you're sitting on your couch watching TV. Yeah. Yeah. Watching TV. You can find, much, you, you, <clears throat> go ahead. Well, oh. yeah, I mean, it, it's, it, you're exactly right. Okay. All right. How, how much time do you spend playing video games, watching TV, reading the news, getting on social media? Um, all these things that are not uh, priority activities for success, right? And that's, that's really what we have to talk about is, is how big of a priority is notching your tag on an elk to you? Is, is exactly. that priority, is that going to be bigger than uh, the amount of time you uh, practice your elk calls or, or is playing a video game more important or mm-hmm. is watching football more important or is, um, you know, whatever, I don't, whatever it is people do with their time. I don't know. Uh, but yeah. I, I'm telling you, you have time. You have time. If, if elk hunting and, and being a successful elk hunter is a priority, you have time. Absolutely. And, you know, one thing that, you know, those that have followed Elk Calling Academy and and have been to the YouTube page and and have been around a while, you guys know what I went through in 2019, Uh, Mm -hmm. you know, when I shared my journey of what I went through. And and that's one thing that I really brought out of that was we have to take one day a week. And yeah. set that aside. There's no training. There's no nothing. It's a rest day and a family day. And that is a day that we focus on our family and we let our bodies rest and recover and just get things right for moving ahead in the next chunk of working out, shooting the bow, working, having a family, you know, all of those things. Now, yeah. I'm not telling and, and by by no means am I saying cut out social media and cut out TV watching. Not at all, because I enjoy just as much as everybody else getting on there and seeing everybody's story and this and that. But like you said, you have to prioritize what's more important to you is sitting there. And, and, and I'll tell you what, social media has a way of sucking you in that it's like, I'm just going to jump on here and check things real quick or, or take a quick look. And the next thing you know, it's like, holy crap, 40 minutes, 45 minutes have gone by. Yeah. How yeah. the and heck what? did that happen? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, one, one thing that I'll, I'll add to what you're saying uh, that I, I think a lot of people would benefit from, from hearing this is I, so I went to this seminar one time for, for work and the guy, the, 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 he wasn't like a motivational speaker. Uh, so, so anybody out there that's kind of like rolling your eyes at that, it wasn't like that, 
but he was consulting. It was a consultative right. seminar, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a dude that grew up uh, barely without any, you know, with, with parents around and all this stuff. He kind of turned into this criminal, right? And he goes and robs this restaurant. And uh, he's, he's down in Colorado. And he's, he, he robs this restaurant in, in Colorado Springs. And he tries to drive out. And uh, somebody took down the, you know, the make and model of the car and the license plate and all this stuff. Uh, so somewhere in between Colorado Springs and Denver, he gets pulled over, uh, had a shotgun in the, in the truck, uh, all this stuff. And, uh, he, finally he gets arrested, goes to prison, spends about 10 years in prison and loses his dad. And while he's in prison, he gets on the phone with his dad prior to his dad dying. And he, uh, his dad says he's kind of whining about being in prison. You know, I've still got this much time left. You know, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I'm a criminal. And, and his dad says to him, you know, um, it could always be worse, worse son. Uh, at least you're still breathing. And that struck exactly. this guy. That struck this guy. He said, the best thing that my dad could say about me right before he died is that at least his son is breathing and I am, I'm a sham. I'm a, I'm a shame. I've shamed my family. I've shamed my, you know, my life and all this stuff. And he, he gets, uh, he gets super motivated at this point and switches his life around. Then they, he finally gets out of prison, comes out of prison and builds a $20 million a year company. Right. And, and so the point of the seminar was he was teaching folks how he built this very successful uh, contracting company. Okay. Mm -hmm. so I'm putting this into perspective. I know it's a little long winded here, but bear with me because what he said at the very end has, has always stuck out in my mind and, and what he said, and, and this is so true. 95% of the population out there, you know, they're, they're just kind of average, right? They're just going on trying to be average, maybe a little bit better. And, and what he said was, it is actually really easy to be great and really easy to be successful, but it's just a little bit easier not to be. And yep. that, that statement, uh, like it was one of those moments in my life, you know, I, he, he said that I'm like, man, that there, that is so true. It, it is, it isn't that hard to be better, but it's easier mm -hmm. not to be better. Right. And, and so that's, I, again, I'm, I'm not trying to turn this into some big motivational speech, but I, that changed my, um, my, my entire train of thought when it came to, you know, my day job and setting goals and, 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 and getting, uh, things on a, on a better track for my life, my health, my, my, uh, my ability to hunt, my, uh, focus on my marriage and, and, and my kids and my day job and, and all these aspects of my life, you know, it all got, it, it, it all improved because I, I, I remember that vividly in the, in the moment he said it. Uh, and, and I think a lot of people can learn from that. And so that's what we're trying to do here. It's, it's super easy yeah. to not practice calling elk, right? But it's not that hard to and, and, practice calling elk. <laughs> yeah, no. And, and to kind of expand on, you know, what you were, what you were talking about there is it, it, it it's a mindset, you know, if, 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 you know, here he was just focusing on, the negative aspects of being in jail and yeah. committing crime and getting caught or his dad on the other hand was focusing on the positive aspect of it was that he was still alive. He was still breathing. He learned a lesson from it. He is going to get a second chance. And so that's all part of it is, is, you know, how you look at things. And so if you don't have things to show you how far you've come. Okay. If you're not tracking these things, all you're doing is looking at that goal, which that goal is basically the top of the mountain. You're standing down at the bottom and all you're doing is looking up at the top of the mountain and all you're focusing is on is how far you have to go. Mm -hmm. But as you climb that mountain and, and you make those little milestones and you track and document this, then you have that ability to turn around and look at how far you've come. And then next thing you know, you're halfway on that mountain. And it's like, like I said, man, from this point on, with each step I take, I'm going to get closer to my goal and farther away from where I started. And that is huge for motivation. 
yeah, an accomplishment. Yeah. I mean, I mean, we all like accolades. I mean, growing up, getting awards and having your name called out and just how good it made you feel. And still, to this day, a lot of people that are listening to this, maybe they got recognized as salesman of the quarter or employee of the month or this or that. And how it rejuvenated them and motivated them to perform better because they got that recognition. Well, when you set goals and you have these goals and you have these sub goals and now you have everything mapped out, your accomplishments are your motivation. That's your kudos. That's your attaboys. Now, mm -hmm. if you have a hunting partner or somebody else that you're working out with, that you have that accountability partner that you can hold each other in check, that's even better because it makes it easier. But if you don't, you have to put things in place that you can check on your own and go, man, look at how far I've come. So you were talking about somebody that's never placed a diaphragm read in their mouth. Man, yeah. do a video on day one. Do a video at the end of week one. Do a video at the end of week two and compare those videos. This is where I started. This is where I was at the end of week one. This is where I ended up at the, at the end of week two. And you will be able to see and hear how far you've come. And that is going to release those endorphins and go, holy crap. God, Look at what I have accomplished in this short amount of time. That's a great idea. That's a great idea to, to, to start with your, your beginner video and, and just kind of make progress videos and compare. I wish I would have done that. All I did was I, I'd record a video and I'd be like, okay, I sound like shit. Let's try it again. And I would delete that video and start again. And, and then I do that again, you know, a week later or whatever. And, and, but if I would have just kept those and tracked that progress, that's a great idea. I wish, I wish I was the originator of that idea. What the hell? You know, winter is a great time to get stocked up, geared up and dialed in for this coming hunt, hunting season coming up in 2021. So I want to save you guys some money. And first off, let's start with Hoffman Boots. Hoffman Boots are the boot of choice at the Western Huntsman. And it used to be, Hoffman Boots used to be like this little North Idaho secret with their hunting boots. But these boots are great boots. They won't cost you as much as some of the other top name brands out there, but they are every bit as good. And to save it yeah, even a little bit more money, I want you to type in the promo code Huntsman10 to save you 10% off at checkout. Now, I got to give you a fair warning real quick up front with Hoppin' Boots. They're, they're like six weeks out right now on orders uh, because everybody is jumping on the Hoppin' Boot train, and you should too. Next, I got Scree Gear, Extreme Mountain Gear. This high-performance hunting attire and gear is specifically tested for camel patterns throughout the North American continent, and it's backed by a great company. Guys, Scree has a great history. I tested this gear all last season, and I put that gear through the ringer up and down, left and right, to and fro. Save you a little bit of money. Use promo code the Western Huntsman at checkout to save you 15% off and free shipping. That's a hell of a deal. Check out Scree Gear. ScreeGear.com. It'll be in the show notes. Last and certainly not least, Phelps Game Calls, the choice, the selected call company of the western huntsman officially for 2021 guys there's some uh, big things happening with phelps game calls and i can't say enough good things about this company what a story started in a just like this workshop and now it's one of the premier hunting call companies out there on the market and if you haven't tried phelps game calls you're really missing out you you really are missing out on those diaphragm elk reads uh, they are amazing, and they will. The amp frame is an absolute game changer. Check it out at Phelps.com and use promo code Huntsman10 at checkout to save you 10%. Let's get back into the conversation, guys. Thank you to our sponsors, and thank you for supporting our sponsors. Here we go. <laughs> because, see, here's the hard part. So especially in the calling aspect of it, when somebody is first starting out, they are comparing themselves to people that have been calling for a long time. Oh, and it's totally. intimidating. But they don't they don't sit there and think about how that individual that is really proficient and sounds really good, they don't think about how that individual was when they first started. They yeah. don't sit there and think about, man, that person was exactly where I am right now when they first got started. 
Man, that's a that's <clears throat> you nailed it with that one. I I actually and it was you. I was I was trying to trying to sound like right. Um, when I was learning to elk call, I remember, I remember playing, uh, you know, blowing the, the, the bugle on the back deck and my wife's sitting out there rolling her eyes at me and I'd be like, how did that sound? Did that sound like Michael Batiste? No, oh. man. Okay. I'm just going to go drown myself in the toilet. I mean, it, it sounded terrible, but no, it just, uh, it, uh, that, that's a, that's a great point that, you know, you don't want to try to. It, you know, comparison is, is, is a bad way to gauge your progress because, you know, people are in, in different circumstances. Like you've been calling for years and, uh, I called for long enough to know that I was a terrible caller until I found guys <laughs> like you, you know, and, and, and then I'm like, okay, no, this, this, there's actually a science to this and a method and a, and a way to learn how to do this better. Um, and, and, uh, you know, now I'm, now I'm really good at calling elk. Um, I, you'd, you'd still whoop my ass on, uh, co- <laughs> you know, competitive stage, but, uh, Hey, I can call in elk. You, you know, and, 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 and here's the thing with that and kind of taking it a step further too, is because so many people will do that too. And I have a lot of students that will sit there and, and, and in fact, you know, one of the things that I offer too, is something that's called couples therapy. Mm-hmm. And couples therapy is is not for husband and wife. It's not for me to, you know, talk your wife into letting you hunt more. It's it's nothing like that at all. And couples therapy is is for hunting partners because within hunting partners, you're going to have strengths and weaknesses that are opposite and complement each other. Mm-hmm. And and I remember last year I was working with uh, a couple of hunting partners, and they were both about the same level as as experience with calling. And they were both using the identical read. And, you know, one of them just, you know, he all of a sudden stops and he goes, but I don't sound anything like him. I don't get the tones that he is. And I said, and you're not going to. And he's like, why? We're using the same read. And I said, is your mouth shaped exactly like his? Does your tongue lay on the read exactly like his? Does the air flow over the read exactly like his? He goes, well, what do you mean? And I said, our mouths are shaped differently. The roof of our mouths are shaped differently. How that reed sits in the roof of our mouth is different. So you can take people that are on the same level with the same exact reed, and you're going to hear variations in the tone and the pitch. It's just how it is. It's just how we're structured. And that's totally okay too. Like if, if if you hunt the same drainage for 10 days straight and there's three different bull elk that give you responses, you'll notice those elk all sound a little bit different. Um, and, exactly. and, and in fact, in fact, you'll, you'll, if you do do that and, and you're working the same, you know, few five, six, seven bulls or whatever over throughout September, you'll start learning. Like, remember when this last September I called you and I told you, you know, I'd stuck this bull. What do you think I should do? I can't find him. Um, yep. And and yep. you and I had that conversation. I drove all the way to the top of the mountain to be able to get phone service. And um, yep. that particular bull, I, I, I even had a name for him. I'd been hunting up there for 10 days. And that was the third time I'd called that bull in. And, and I called him Mr. Chuckles because all he liked to do, he just liked to chuckle. He chuckled and chuckled and chuckled. It was the funniest damn thing. He, he, uh, he, he, and, and so there was that bull. And, and I knew as, as soon as he responded to me the night that I shot him, I knew exactly what bull that was because I'd been hunting that mm-hmm. same area and I'd been getting a lot of action up there. And I knew there, I, I knew there was like three other bulls that I'd had interactions with. And, and I knew each one at that point. And so when I shot him, I knew which one he was. Uh, and, yep. and it had been over a week since the first time I had an encounter with him and, and they all have, you know, different tones and variations. And, and he was the only bull that would chuckle up there. The other bulls, they, they didn't do that. Um, and, and so it, it was just, it, it, don't sweat it if you don't sound just like your hunting partner. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I was sitting here thinking about, um, you know, can't hurt me, David Goggins book. And one of the Mm -hmm. things that I was sitting there, I remember reading about was, you you know, it goes in line with what we were talking about with priorities. And, you know, he was, he was getting ready for uh, an endurance race and an an ultra hundred mile, you know, race. And, and 
that's one of the things that he was talking about is how to balance all this. And and I remember one of the things that kind of popped into my head where we were talking about where I don't have time to work out or I don't have time to do this, that, you know, there's people that I don't have time to work out, but, you know, I'm going to get in my car and I'm going to drive 45 minutes to work because of traffic. But you know what? man, the place that I work at, they have locker rooms, they have showers. What if I was to jump on a bike and ride instead of 45 minutes, I'd probably make it to work in 30 minutes. So I'd be there 15 minutes earlier. I can take a shower, get into my work clothes. And then at the end of the day, I can ride back home and again, get home sooner. Yeah. So you're actually getting, you're actually getting to work faster. You're getting home sooner, which is more time with the family, but you're also getting your physical conditioning. Yeah. yeah. And maybe, maybe you, you, maybe you decide I'm going to do that three days a week. So it's, it, it's all in, in how you look at things and, and how you, you know, prioritize, you know, we've talked about it, what your priorities are and, and, you know, gear, we kind of touched on that. I don't know how many people that will spend time throughout the summer to pick up new gear and they don't even test that gear until hunting season starts. Mm hmm. Yep. That happens all the time. Hey, you know, what else drives me crazy is, is, um, going back to what we were talking about. Uh, I, I don't have time to learn how to call, or I don't have time to read a book about elk behavior or, or a book about the biology of elk and, or deer, you know, it doesn't matter what species we're talking about here, knowing those species, you know, whatever, but, right. uh, and, and they're out there, but then, then I, you know, I call them up and, and, and they're like, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. I'm, I'm, uh, hoping to put everything together. If I have enough time to practice, uh, by September, I should be pretty good. And I call them up and they're golfing and it's like, yeah, I, I'm like, well, have you, have you shot your bow? Have you, have you done anything to get ready for September? Cause it's in two weeks. Oh no, I just, I just haven't, I haven't had time. Okay. So you're out on the golf course which is a lame game to play anyway. Okay. I won't say that. Sorry. Sorry. Sorry, golfers. <laughs> I knew you were going to go there. I knew you were going to go there. So The audience knows. But, like no, the they, others. Absolutely. And I, and I understand what you're saying. And, and I think the biggest thing is, is, is it's going to go back to if somebody was to document, take a week or two and document what they did each day. Mm-hmm. It's amazing how much time that you can find because, you know, a lot of people at sports shows or when I'm doing seminars or this or that, I have this discussion with a lot of people and the I don't have time always comes up. And, you know, the, and the first thing they want to sacrifice is sleep. You know, oh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to cut out sleep. So, you don't have to, if you were to document what you did throughout your waking time each day and then sat down and looked at that and then took all that information and plugged it in. Okay. In a two week span, I worked X number of hours. I commuted to work X number of times. I, you know, X number of minutes or X number of hours, depending on how it came up. I spent X amount of time on social media. I spent X amount of time watching TV. I spent X amount of time golfing. I spent X amount of time doing this. And once you actually get to take a look at that, it's like, man, if I cut 20 minutes here and 20 minutes there and 20 minutes there, all of a sudden you found a two to three hour window that you could work on these things. Exactly. It's just, it's the exact same concept when you go from uh, not intentionally budgeting your money to all of a sudden coming up with a budget and, 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 and this stuff just hits you in the face. It's like, wow, I'm spending, <clears throat> you know, $75 a month on double, triple mocha latte, uh, you know, whatever coffees that people charge like five to $7 for. They're insane. Um, yep. <clears throat> they, they realize what they're spending in it. And then when you take that money and you budget it, right, you budget it and, and you, you give every dollar like this, this, this purpose and all this stuff, all of a sudden you got all this extra money. It's the same thing with time. And now oh, I'm absolutely. sensitive. 
I, I, you know, what's funny. I'm super sensitive to even saying that because somebody on social media had like reposted one of my episodes and somebody in the comments uh yeah I I I'm I'm kind of geeky like that. Sometimes I'll look at the comments, whatever. Um, somebody wrote, "Oh yeah, I listened to the Western Huntsman. He's the Dave Ramsey of hunting." And I'm like, "What the hell does that mean? I, I what like if I if I don't understand how that that uh, is applied to the Western Huntsman? You know what I mean? Like I I don't talk about if it, well let's put it to you this way: if hunting were and successful hunting was like a way to gauge how rich you were and financially independent you were, I'd be broke. So I don't know how that applies <laughs> to me. <laughs> but, but, you know, I, 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 and I understand what they said. I understand their comment because of what you just said about the mocha lattes. So again, that's another goal right there is I want to buy a new bow this year, but I don't have any extra money. So again, mapping out and writing down where your money goes. So now here's here's the thing that you can do is 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 both on the time ends aspect and on the money aspect of it. Then, like you said, you budget it out. So once you have that capture, you know how much money you're spending each week of going out and eating lunch, how much how many coffees you're getting from Starbucks, all this stuff, and all of a sudden you find that frivolous money, basically you pull the cushions up from the couch and you find all this money sitting underneath the couch cushions. Well, now you can take that money and you can budget it down. You're not, you're not necessarily cutting those things out, but instead of going out and eating for lunch five days a week, I'm going to bring a lunch from home four days a week and I'll still go out and eat lunch on Fridays. Yeah. Yeah. But now the amount of money that you can save. Now, same thing with your time. Okay, you've budgeted it or you've written it down how much time you spend. So now you get yourself a day planner and you all of a sudden start writing it down. I'm going to wake up at this time each day. And from the time I wake up until this time, I'm going to do this activity. From that time to that time, I'm going to do this activity. From this time to this time, I'm going to work. From this time to this time, I'm going to do this. And you break out what exactly you're going to do throughout the day. Now, here's the deal that, you know, okay, I'm going to allot myself an hour a day to either watch TV or go on social media. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A you lot. have that hour. You have that hour. Set a timer on your phone. As soon as that timer goes off, get up from that activity and move on to your next activity that you've allotted. Same thing with I want to buy a new bow or I want to upgrade gear or I want to I want to get a new lightweight backcountry tent. Mm hmm. You need yep. to first take a look at everything that you're doing, break that down and then map everything out. Now, it's it's going to become, you know, when you first do this, you're going to feel so restricted because you're in this very strict routine. But yeah. after 21 days, after 21 days, the 2190 rule, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. after 21 days, it becomes a habit. After 90 days, it becomes a lifestyle. Yeah. That's a great point. That that's and it's super important what you said there. You you had mentioned like a day timer, or uh, you know I use my calendar on my phone, you know, and it gives you the little notifications. And uh, you, you know I have very specific. I, I use my calendar like it's the you know it's like biblical for me. Uh, like like for today, you know I'm I every hour is scheduled out. Uh, down to, I knew at five o'clock, I'm jumping on with Michael Batiste at Elk Calling Academy to, to, to record this podcast, right? Um, I, I right. write in there, you know, from 8 a.m. to 8.20, I'm responding to emails. Uh, and I stick to that. And and my day is packed. Yep. And then I free that up at a certain time. You know, it was, usually it's like five o'clock in the afternoon. After that, that time is allotted to my family. And and that's that's yep. what, nothing interrupts that. Um, and so th I, I think that if, if people, and they don't have to be as, as crazy about their calendar as I am, cause I am, I'm, I'm a little over the top with it, but, uh, it's important. That's how I, I, I keep everything, um, you know, organized, but, right. but if you do have some kind of system like that, and you guys are listening to this, that, that kind of system will really, but yeah, like Michael was saying, you have to, you have to use it and, and stick to it for 21 days. And it's going to be like a drag. 
for 21 days. It's like, oh, mm-hmm. I got to stick to my calendar. But it, it, discipline yourself to stick to that calendar. Put it in there at from from uh, 5.30 p.m. to 5.45, I am practicing my elk calls. And I'm going to go lock myself mm-hmm. in the closet or I'm going to go for a drive with my diaphragm. I'm going to do whatever I can. But on this day, from 5.30 to 5.45, I am having interrupted time. My phone is on airplane mode and I'm practicing my diaphragm calls. And those that the calendar uh, w- will make a big impact. It's a, it's a huge beneficiary or beneficial thing that I've, I've done with my life that, that has really helped me find a lot more time and produced a lot of freedom because a lot of people think, you know, oh, well, that's all calendared out. It sounds like you're just kind of a prisoner to your calendar on your phone. No. Now, what it does, it, what it does is allows me to accomplish more throughout the day. And I have a lot more time, uh, b- by it, when it comes to the end of the week. And I've looked back at all the things I've accomplished. Plus I had all this extra time I, and, and right. that extra time. I don't care if that extra time is spent hanging with the kids or drinking whiskey around a campfire. That extra time is what, uh, you'll notice you have to do the things like mm-hmm. you were talking about, you know, relax, uh, play with the kids, you know, uh, maybe you find some extra time to, to, to shoot your bow. And, and, and on that note, you were talking about budgeting for a new bow. Don't buy a new bow on August 30th for a September one elk hunt. Um, you know, you exactly. got to, you got to plan that out. You want, you want a couple months of practice. How long do you recommend for that? Um, you know, it, everybody's a little bit different. Um, you know, it depends, you know, where they're at. If they've been shooting for a little while, actually their proficiency with new equipment is actually just going to ramp up a lot faster versus somebody that's kind of new to it because they're still, you know, learning a lot of the new techniques. But but still, it's one of yeah. those things that you need to do year round. And, you, you know, I, th- there's a couple of things that that, that I do. And, and, and so one of the things that that I get, it's 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 a day at a glance journal. You can get them on Amazon for 15, 20 bucks. And, and it has, you know, each day of the year. And and what I do on the top of each day is I write build B U I L D. So B stands for body. U stands for you, a goal you have. I is income producing activity. L is relationships and D is development. I write that Mm -hmm. at the top on each day. And so the other thing I have, too, is what's called an I am journal. And so what I do is when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is I go down, I turn the coffee pot on, and then I come up and I grab my I am journal. And in in the I am journal, you have an AM and a PM entry. So the I am is your burning desire. So I, you know, for example, I have a burning desire to dot, dot, dot. Then the next part is how are you going to achieve that? Three spots. How am I going to achieve that? How are you going to feel while doing those? And then you write an I am statement. I am successful. I am whatever. So then at the end of the day, I grab my I am journal. And again, I write my I am statements. I write three things that I'm thankful for. Ooh, that's powerful. And I write, and I write how I felt while doing those things. Yeah. And then I grab and then I grab my day at a glance and I circle letters. Okay, did I work out today? I'm going to circle B for body. Did I do anything that I wanted to do? Yes, I did. I'm going to circle the U as a business owner. Did I do any income producing activities today? Yep, I circled the I. Did I do any relationship development? Did I spend time with my kids? Did I spend time with my girlfriend? Yes, I did. Development. Did I read a book? So, so yeah, my, my morning, like I said, I go down, I turn the coffee on, I grab my I am journal. I write in that. I go down, I get a cup of coffee and then I come up and I read one chapter of a book while I'm drinking my coffee. Huh? So there, there, there's my development. And so the, the thing with this is, is with the I am journal, it's basically your, your, like I said, I have a burning desire to be more proficient at elk calling. Mm -hmm. How are you going to achieve those? You know, then you, but then at the end of the day, you're giving thanks for, you know, you're being thankful, you're showing gratitude, but also to that build. And you're not going to circle every letter every day. 
And, and if you're circling every letter every day, then your goals are too easy. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. But that's the, cool. The, I, the, I really the, like that build process. I, I really like that. Well, because then every single day you can sit there and go. And, and, and again, because of what I went through through 20 in, in 2019, I know how we can get so focused on goals mm-hmm. that our relationship and our family suffer. Yeah, good point. So by this, you're writing it down each day. You're circling those letters and go, holy crap. You're delegating. I, I didn't do any relationship strengthening today. Yeah. You're delegating your priorities to, to certain times of the day where, uh, cause that, that, th- I think that's true, especially for a lot of dudes. I think that, that, that happens. We get, we have a tendency to get so laser focused on something. Like yep. I could totally do that with this podcast, right? Uh, cause there's so much work that needs to be done with the podcast between, you know, recording and editing and, and trying to promote it and all this other stuff. I could, I could like destroy my family life if, if I didn't stay, uh, you know, try, you know, keened in to what my family needs for me. And, and, mm. uh, and I'm bad at that. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm guilty of doing that. And so my wife, however, is really good at coming unglued on me and reminding me that I'm being an asshole, you know? And, and so that it works out, it works out. And so, um, that's a, that's why I like your system that you, t- you talked about because you, you're able to delegate all of your priorities into how you're going to break out your day. And, and, and that keeps you focused on all these different, th- these things that are priorities in your mind that, that are important to you. And I, I think a lot more people need to do that. They need to focus on that more. Yeah. Well, and it just goes back to, <clears throat> you know, first off, sitting down, writing your overall goal and then breaking that goal into sub goals and then mapping out how you were going to get there. You have those milestones, but then you also have daily accountability of are you on track? And if you skipped a day or missed a day, it, it's OK. But you have that accountability because when you sit down and actually circle those and, and, and I mean, I may that day at a glance, too, I may write down exactly what I did that day for mm-hmm. accountability, what I did for body, what I did for relationship, what I did for those and and it's and it's those constant checks each day that keep you on the path to achieve those goals. Yeah. Yeah, great stuff, Michael. I I let me let's kind of let's kind of not necessarily switch gears but kind of re um you know just turn the wheel slightly here. Um <clears throat> When we're when we're talking about goals as a hunter, and and we're going to stick to elk hunting, and and again, I don't I don't care if somebody's September uh, archery hunting or rifle hunting in October. Um, I've I've gotten some messages recently that I'm I'm not throwing enough love to my October rifle hunters out there, and and for that, guys, I apologize. So, um, this, sure, the, most of this is applicable to to either kind, right? Um, I, I like what in your mind. Let's say we've got a hunter out there. He's uh, he or she's been hunting for a long time and they're mildly successful every, you know, five to 10 years. They put an elk down, uh, but they they're really motivated to get to the next level where they're more successful, uh, almost on like an annual basis. They're they're notching that tag. And that's that's like what their goal is. Um, mm-hmm. can, can you talk about like what they should be focused on uh, to what kind of goals they should be setting? Uh, and what kind of milestones are they going to look for to let them know that they're they're getting close to achieving that goal? Does that did I did I yeah. word that right? Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and and I think one of the things is you know surround yourself with the type of people you want to be. You know, immerse yourself in those types of individuals. Talk Jeez, to them. Man, what are you so, doing hanging out with me? I'm trying to elevate your game, bud. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but no, it's, it's, you know, talk to those people that, so if you have a goal that you want to be consistency to where you harvest an elk almost every year, take a look around, see who are consistently fulfilling that and then talk to them. Mm-hmm. You know, talk to them what their mindset is. Talk to them, you know, how they go about getting prepared for that. And, and you can find little nuances and little tricks that 
you can add to your routine. So, you know, I think Tony Robbins said it once, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. No, man, I think so, that was Albert Einstein. I think, I think that was oh, Einstein. I, I, maybe we're, we're both right and we're both wrong. I don't know. Yeah. Or maybe it was, yeah, maybe it was Einstein and, and, you know, he just, he just reiterated it. I just heard him, you know, I just heard Tony Robbins say it, but, but no, it's, it's, it's very true. And, you know, I think you are right. I think it was Albert Einstein, but anyways, but so that's the thing right there. So, you know, if, if you're a one every five year or one every six year and you want to increase that, but you're not changing anything that you're doing, how do you expect now? Granted, there's a there's a degree of luck that plays into it, but I can guarantee that once you start talking to these individuals that have that consistency, you're going to find these things. And it's they're constantly studying. They're constantly improving themselves. But a lot of them are mapping out and having that check of I'm not really in competition with anybody. I'm in competition with myself. And I, today I want to be just a little bit better than what I was yesterday. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, like you said, reading a book. Okay. God, with audio books nowadays, you have the ability that you can, you know, get that. So maybe, maybe these individuals pick up a book or two from, um, you know, I'm going to name drop from a previous guest of yours, Dr. Valerius Geist. Oh, man. You know, one of my favorites. And, tap, and, and tap into that knowledge. You know, learn a little bit more about what you're pursuing. You know, study a little bit more about the area that you're hunting. Uh, if you're a rifle hunter, maybe you change up the type of round that you're shooting that has a little bit more performance that allows you to stretch out an additional 100 or 200 yards from what you were capable of before. Yeah. So it's it's all these little things that combined create huge results. So, but so, it's all little steps. So with, with you, Michael, you're, you're one of those guys, you've been prolifically successful as an elk hunter. Um, you've, you've got lots of notch tags under your belt. Uh, and, and, and you just, you just, you have this way of delivering every year, uh, you know, and, 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 and essentially what I just said, notching these tags, right? So in your mm-hmm. mind, what what do you do personally? Like, how do people look at Michael and say, how does Michael do that every year? What do you do to make sure that you're on top of your game every September and, and you're, you're getting these tags notched? It's continuous expansion of knowledge. It's It's continually you know, growing, we can always learn more. We can always, you know, be better. And, you know, whether that's, you know, studying elk behaviors, you know, I'm, I'm always constantly, um, you know, looking for new resources to tap into, um, you know, also too is, is keeping skills sharp. Um, you know, anytime I do watch a hunting video, you know, the elk hunting video, I'm not, Unfortunately, I, I, I am watching it for an enjoyment, but also, too, I'm dissecting it. Mm-hmm. You know, what's that elk's mindset? What is he doing? How is he reacting? How is the how is the caller, you know, responding and how is the elk responding to what they're doing? And based on that response, you know, what would I do? And, you know, then, oh, man, I was in that situation be- once before or twice before. And this is what I did. And this happened. But also, too, um, you know. Like I said, one of my goals every year is always learning more about the area that I'm hunting because we're creatures of habit Mm -hmm. that we get into our comfort zone. We get into our comfort bubble. So we learn a new area and there's one drainage. That is, by God, the drainage that I hunt. It's what I know. It's this and that. And that's just my drainage. Well, what are you going to do next year if you show up and there's seven trucks at that drainage? Yeah. Yeah. You're that, pain. that that's, that's you a painful to... lesson too. Uh, and it is. <laughs> you know, I, I have a favorite area, uh, that, that I just, you know, it's, 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 I don't remember who said it, but 
it was like, you know, you don't fall in love with an area, fall in love with finding elk. And I've fallen into that trap where it's like, okay, I've seen three or four different elk. I shot an elk here one year and I keep going back there. But you uh-huh. know, if, if a pack of wolves is in there the first week of September, that, that area is blown for the, the month, yep. you, you know, or, or yep. like you said, a bunch of new hunters discovered it or, or, or whatever. Um, okay. Yeah. So that, that's a good point. I, I, I like guys like me need reminders like that. Well, and I'm, I, and even so, okay. So even if you do have your favorite drainage, start learning more about it. How can you get in more efficient? If you get an animal down somewhere in that drainage, what's the best way to get them out? And, and by continually learning the area that you're in, you're going to find better ways to get in that make you more efficient, that basically put you on elk a lot faster. So, because you're not always coming in the same way, you're not always doing the same thing, you're not always repetitive, you're mixing it up, but you learn more about that area. And then all of a sudden you're going to find these little hidden gems and these little pockets that was like, my gosh, I've hunted here for five years and I never knew this spring wallow was here. And, you know, cause, oh, I walked through it during the summertime and it was just some tall grass, but now here I am stumbled across it in September and it's a 15 foot by 20 foot mud hole wallow that is just thrashed and torn up. Mm-hmm. But those are things that when you're hiking and learning your area, all of a sudden, you know, you can look at that grassy, marshy area and go, man, it doesn't really look much like a wallow right now because the grass has grown over it. But you make a mental note to, hey, I'm going to go check this during September. And then you go in there in September. And sure enough, you do find multiple wallows in there or something like that. And it's an area that you've never hunted because it never really drew any interest to you. Yeah. Or it didn't look like anything. But continually learning your area, you know, you're going to discover all kinds of things. And it was funny because... Um, you know, last season we were, when we were hunting, we were up in this, in, uh, up in this canyon and we went from one side to the other. And when we dropped down and we crossed this little Creek, I was like, man, this is really cool. And I took the phone out and I snapped a picture real quick and threw it back in and kept hunting. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until like three, four weeks ago that I looked at that picture and I was like, whoa, that is exactly the head of a mountain lion on that rock right there. I never oh, even noticed it. Are you serious? Took that. Yeah, the rock. In fact, I posted it on my Facebook page and said, I didn't realize this until I was just going back through pictures. But you look at it and yeah, there's a rock on the side that looks exactly the profile, has the cat's face, everything on it. And what's crazy is I posted that picture and, and, and I didn't say what it was. And I said, I never realized what I captured in this picture until now. Let me know when you see it. Oh, and people in the- I remember that post. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Well, people down below were commenting and then all of a sudden somebody goes, wow, do you see the face of the fox right across from the mountain lion? And I said, what the heck are you talking about? And so I pull the picture up and I'm like, you know, they explained where it was and I pull it up and I'm like, no way. <laughs> and yeah, there's a face of a fox in there too. But you know, it, it's little things like that, that paying attention to detail while we're hiking the area. We're not just out there hiking, covering ground because we've hunted this area for a few years. Mm-hmm. We're looking for specific things and signs that we didn't notice before, that we didn't tap into before. Maybe it's an area that you usually go through in the morning, but now you're there in the afternoon and the way the light hits it differently. It could totally it's change gonna, it. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's so, a, that, that's like a really good segue to uh, something that I like. I like to ask, you know, expert level hunters like you, um, you went through last season and I'm highly suspicious that you, you learned something and you had like a key takeaway from last season. And, and I think mm-hmm. that, that a lot of, uh, a lot of hunters, sometimes they come out of season uh, you know, it's, uh, they're, they've gotten through hunting, hunting season. They didn't tag any, you know, notch any tags and, you know, they're frustrated, but, but they're not paying attention to some of the key takeaways that they learned and carrying yes. that on for the next season. Can you, can you share, did you have any key takeaways from last season that you could share with us? 
Absolutely. Listen to that little voice. So, and, and what I mean by that is we've got an area that we will jump on the side by sides and, and ride up an old road to get up top to um, <clears throat> hunt a bench. Mm-hmm. And there's this one area on the way up that has always piqued my interest. And I'm like, I want to hike in there. I want to check this out. Something was drawing it to me, but I was always like, yeah, it's, it's right next to the road, you know, the amount of traffic and, and nah, it just wouldn't be. Went in there last year. Good Lord, the number of rubs and beds and springs. And what's crazy is the timber is so thick in there and the creeks are so loud. What it is, it's, it's basically, it's two, two creek drainages with a center ridge in between. And those creek drainages are fairly heavily timbered. Ah, yeah. The other thing, the other thing too, is it's less than a mile because the, because the road kind of circles back and goes up above it. And it's less than a mile from the lower road to the upper road. So again, you're just sitting here going, yeah, it's only a mile in between and, and, and this and that. And, and in fact, I don't even think it's quite a mile, but you know, I always found reasons not to go in there, even though my little voice was saying, you need to check this spot out. Oh, I'm glad you said that. I'm cause I have like three spots like that. I always drive by them and I'm like, <clears throat> you know, I ought to just, I ought to just take a walk. And and hike up in there and see what's in there and and I'm always hesitant to do so, so um, I'm glad because that and, and and I guess one of the points I'm trying to make here for for listeners out there is um, w- w- we're listening to a guy that's been you know he, he's a serial elk killer. This isn't you know <laughs> this isn't me the host you know you're talking to. This is a serial elk killer that that is expressing you know, key takeaways from last season, meaning that uh, as many elk as he's killed, he's still learning. He's still taking away things. He's still analyzing what went right. You were talking about watching videos. Uh, I love watching hunting videos. People post them and I'll watch them. And, and, and I, I always try to find a key takeaway. Like I, I have never heard an elk make that sound. I wonder why that elk did that. I wonder why he, yep. he went that way. I wonder why he made that noise. You know, what happened there? Um, and, and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I, that's what I love about you is you, you, you're always analyzing and thinking about that kind of stuff. And so key takeaways, I think, are a huge part of setting goals for the next year, too. Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, what it showed us, in fact, we did a little test where one of us hiked halfway between the roads and we had one on the bottom road and another one went up on the top road and the person in the middle started bugling. Mm-hmm. And, and you, you know, we, we, we basically were you know, communication with each other. That person in the middle was screaming his head off and neither of us could hear him. So now I'm sitting here going, how many elk were sitting right in that area screaming and we never could hear them. Mm. They could be rutting, having a rut fest, screaming all day long in that zone. And we would never, ever hear them. And, you know, I've talked about it quite a bit in the Alcoholing Academy is, you know, think outside the box, find areas like this that everybody else is going to drive by. Yeah. And it's, and it's a lot of times those, those, those little tiny pockets that you could find good elk. And there was multiple bulls in this area. It, it was not just one bull running. So, Remember two creek drainages. There was two bulls that were herd bulls that lived in each drainage, and then each of them had a couple of satellites with their cows, and they stuck to their specific drainages. Now, when it came time to feed, the one on the southern creek kind of came out through a clear cut and followed a ridge down to a clear cut below, and then morning would become that ridge up and go right back into his creek drainage. The one on the north creek would roll out onto a flat and then go up into a clear cut to ah, feed. Yeah. And then, and then, and then morning time would circle back down. So neither group really crossed paths with each other. And because of that center ridge, neither one would really know the other one was over there really running that hard. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm sure they knew each other was there, but that's what's crazy. You could work the one drainage up in the, the one creek drainage up in the morning. And then hang up at the p uh, up at the pinnacle of that, and then work the other one down in the evening, and you're working two completely different groups of elk. Yeah, yeah, 
That's cool, man. And and I love what you said about uh, finding areas that people drive by. Um, that that's that is like seriously sound advice. I, and I learned I learned this through uh, mule deer hunting when I was super fanatical before I got this whitetail bug. When I was super fanatical, <laughs> and I'm still fanatical about mule deer. Don't don't get me wrong, but um, I you know everybody wants to find that parking spot, right? They they always want to find the right. trailhead, the 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 area that allows them to pull off. Man, I'll park my truck somewhere. It looks like I just broke down and, and abandoned my truck and left it. I, I, you know, I'm I'm parked on the hill. It looks like you could just about tip my truck over because I have to get off the road, and and I'll yep. I'll hike into those areas, and you will find diamonds in the rough in those kind of areas like that because nobody goes in them. You'll find sheds that people yep. never go in and look for sheds. You'll find you'll find the animals in September or October or November if you're hunting deer. Uh, you, you know, all those areas that, that, that is a, that's a super important point that, that I, I really try to kind of hammer home with people is, is don't always think that you have to go to a trailhead or something, you know, or an old mm-hmm. logging road or, or somewhere, some kind of destination, find some random spot that looks elky and go check it out. Hopefully, yeah. And then you've on done, the flip side, you know, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, let's, let's give the, the rifle hunter some love. So, okay. You've, you've got a spot like this that, you know, you necessarily don't want to hike through with or this or this or that. So take a look at the map and maybe there's a road on the opposite ridge or the opposite side of the Canyon that you can gain elevation. And then you can sit there in a lawn chair with your spotting scope and look at those clear cuts in the mornings or the evenings. Mm-hmm. And so you're sitting over there glassing and then all of a sudden you see elk movement, you see herd movement. Now you've, you, you've done this a few times. You understand their patterns. Now you look at the map going, okay, at this time I've documented, I've written it down that, you know, they normally leave and, and head to that feed at this time or that time. And you're documenting all of this. And so then you get on the map and go, okay, I want to be positioned here that is going to give me the clear shot. It's going to be, you know, 385 yards to when they step into this clearing. If I'm sitting on this spot right here, I don't have to worry about thermals blowing in. They can stay in their normal patterns. And so you you take that same approach with rifle hunting that you set it up the same way. You do the homework, you learn their movements, you understand your area, you know your vantage points that's going to give you the best coverage and you're keeping that coverage within your effective shooting range. And so then when the hunt comes around, it's the confidence that you step out into the field with that is huge. It's no longer, I hope I'm going to get an elk or I think I'm going to get an elk. And this is the difference between that once every five years to the consistency. It's because of the work and the knowledge. It's not stepping out in the field going, I hope, I think. It's I am, I will, I know it Mm. because you've done the homework, you've studied enough, you have the knowledge, you've spent the time, you know, behind the trigger that you have the proficiency that you're just going to step out there. And that confidence is huge. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. (laughs) I love, I love that. The confidence knowing, I just, I can't even express in words how important that is knowing uh, and we're talking, we're talking elk hunting right now. This is, this is an episode really keyed in on elk, right? Uh, but this is going to be applicable to any game species, but, but just knowing that game species, just knowing their behaviors, knowing what they eat, knowing when they eat, knowing how they react to thermals and wind and storms and rain and sleet and, um, all these things that these factors that these animals, you know, they, this is what they do for a living. And so you have to know what it is they do for a living if you expect to find them on a consistent basis. So instead of going mm-hmm. out blind and, 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 you know, so-called shooting from the hip, uh, when you have that knowledge in your mind, you know, you, you know how these elk behave, you know, their travel corridors, you know, why those are travel corridors, you know, why they're camped out there during the middle of the day versus uh, down below in the meadow at night versus, you know, where they're at, at sunup and, and, and all these things. I, and, and you know me, Michael, I, I geek out with that stuff. I love it. I, I, I could get Dr. Valerius Geist on every week 
and never get bored of, uh, of talking about that kind of stuff because I do, I, I geek out on it. And, um, so, so yeah, Absolutely. that's, that's a great point. That's a great point. So, um, is there, is there any, and, 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 oh, and, and I think that, I think that's one area where, you know, a lot of people don't put as much time in because, you, you know, they do focus on their conditioning. They do focus on shooting, but they don't put the time in to really learning and understanding the animal, you know, whether it be mule deer or whitetail or elk or pronghorn antelope or, you know, whatever it's, you know, they don't do. And, and, and in fact, one of the, one of the things that I love is, I love the community of sheep hunters. Yeah. They're because tight, a lot of times, tight. you know, big, they are. And, and, and the, and, and the cool thing is, is they just want to be a part of the hunt because they know that, you know, they can only draw them once in a lifetime, but there's this group that if somebody in Idaho draws a Rocky mountain, bighorn sheep tag, it's amazing how many people will reach out to him. Hey, what that or him or her, but what tag do you, did you draw? Oh, that's this area. Would you like some help? We have a group that has hunted that area that knows the area. And then now all of a sudden you have this group that is stepping in to share their knowledge because they want you to be successful on that hunt. And that's what you have today with, um, you know, you, you talked about these hunting videos. More and more people have cameras out there now that are filming their hunts. And so there's so much more activity of the animals that are getting captured that you have all this at your fingertip that you can go watch these videos. And it doesn't matter what species you're after, but you have all these videos that you can go and study behavior pay attention to what they're living in pay attention to what they're moving through and then you can take that information and then go to your hunt area and go i have areas that look like that i have areas that have that type of brush i have areas that have that and so mm -hmm. you're not just sitting there watching those videos but you're gathering information on those that you can then take to your hunting area and match up and lo and behold all of a sudden it's like wow man this area of my my hunt area or this spot in my hunt area man it really does hold a bunch of mule deer up here in this in these avalanche shoots because i recognize this bush that i saw on that video mhm mm mhm mm yep uh, knowing, yeah, that, that's, that's a huge part of it. The feed part the uh, I mean, I mean, just all of that stuff. And, and, and I get so fired up about it. Uh, and it, it leads me to one question you, you just mentioned. Do you, do you do any whitetail hunting down there? Like, are there a lot of white, you don't have a lot of whitetails in your neck of the woods. I know, but do you do any whitetail hunting? No, actually, the whitetail population is becoming more and more. And in fact, when I listened to that episode uh, that you had with the Valerius guys that was talking about, you know, the whitetails pushing the mule deer out, because that's one thing that we've had a lot of discussions down here about is how the whitetails are taking over what used to be predominantly mule deer country. And yeah. as soon as I, I listened to that episode and, and what Valerius guys said about it, it makes complete and utter sense of, you know, why it's happening. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's, there's, there's actually areas there. there yeah. There's, there's areas down here that, you know, the whitetail population <laughs> is getting, uh, you know, pretty dang good. And, and yeah, I do enjoy, uh, you know, chasing the whitetails. Uh, you know, I used to always go up to, to Grangeville on the late season whitetail hunt. And now oh, because you of, you know, their migration or their expansion. Yeah. I used to, I used to always go up to, to Grangeville and, and hunt whitetails up there. But now because of, you know, them expanding into that mule deer country down here, don't have to travel as far. Yeah, for sure. I I'm in Grangeville all the time, man. That that's uh that's pretty cool. So, um, there's something else. There's so, these public land mountain whitetails and, and I, I never had a huge mm. thing for these things until I started talking to Troy Pottinger, who's been on the show a few times, uh, who's just like a, you know, mm -hmm. he's a legendary mountain whitetail hunter. Um, and, uh, man, I'm, I'm, I'm into them, man. I I'm super into these damn mountain whitetails. They're, they're a lot of fun. They're a hoot. Uh, it, it's something else. I'd mm -hmm. encourage anybody that's never hunted them in, in the mountains on public land, uh, you know, do it yourself. Uh, shoot. 
you, you're missing out if you haven't tried these whitetails. They're they're a lot of fun. It's totally different than mule deer hunting. Oh, absolutely. And, and, and that's one of the things that, you know, listen to that episode with, you know, Dr. Geist that, you know, describing, you know, the difference in the behavior behind between whitetail and mule deer. And I, I learned a ton in that episode oh, geez. Uh, about whitetail and, and mule deer behavior. And, um, you know, amazing. it was interesting because, you know, well, and, you know, when you guys got on the discussion about, you know, the crossbreeding uh -huh. and, and just how that happens, I've, I've got a deer here in my house that I, I've never had him officially scored, but he's in that 175 to 180 range. But it's it's crazy that if you cover the back part of the rack, it looks exactly like a whitetail front. But if you cover the front, the back of it definitely looks like a mule deer. And that's one of the things that I sat there and looked when I got that buck was, God, I wonder if this is a cross. But now after listening to, to Dr. Geist, I know it's not. It's it's just the the way this buck grew his antlers. Yeah, just kind of an anomaly on on that. And and that was a that was a big part of what I got out of Dr. Geist is, um, you know, I'm I'm usually a guy if if I've been hunting a few days and and uh, in this area that I hunt mule deer up here, which they're they're pretty far and few between, um, you know, if I if I see in the past if I've seen like a three point or better, I'm taking that buck. Uh, I'm not I'm mm -hmm. not some trophy hunter, right? And not that there's anything wrong with that, but for for me, I, I'm I'm just not a trophy hunter. So three point or better, I'll take that sucker. Well, after, after that discussion with him and learning that, um, that you, you, you really, you're, you're good with the three and, and even the forked horns, just don't shoot the big four uh -huh. eyes because those are the ones right. that protect the mule deer does from getting bred from the whitetail does. And so, um, you know, it, it, that's an interesting concept and that's going to be hard. That's a hard pill for hunters to swallow. You know, if you, you see a big old mule deer buck and you know there's whitetail in the area as well you should let that guy walk i mean you should it, it, that's that's what's going to protect that mule deer population and if you if you take that Absolutely. you take that big mule deer buck out those whitetail bucks are going to breed those mule deer does and those uh the offspring's only going to make it about 12 to 18 months or so and uh that's that you know it's a problem it's a problem we used to have tons of mule deer up in this area uh and now we don't and so um I, I yeah I, I learned a ton from Dr. Geist and, and one of my favorite books that he wrote is called Mule Deer Country. Um, it's mm -hmm. it's like one of those books that's got it's it's packed with all the scientific information, right? But it's right. it's it's written in a way that dudes like me can understand. You know what I mean? Because I'm not a scientist, and so w the way he lays it out. Uh, it just, it makes sense. And, and it's, it's backed by, you know, real science, science. studies and, and, yeah. and, you know, years of research. Uh, it's not just some, uh, that's why that stuff is important to me. And that's why I get so irritable about like this ballot box wildlife management BS that's been going on, uh, throughout <laughs> the country. And, and anyway, that's a whole other podcast, dude. Yeah, no, and, and his book on elk hunting is or, or elk is is the same way. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm just the information contained in it, and, and and that's one of those things that I encourage anybody if you really want to expand your knowledge on elk, that is definitely a book you need to put on the top of your list. Yeah, it's hard to, to get pick up and read. It's it's tough to find one, but you yeah. can find a lot of used ones. And if you get on Amazon, you can usually find them. Sometimes they're a little bit pricey depending on availability, but that one's called Elk Country. Uh, the, yep. the one I was talking about is called Mule Deer Country. And uh, yep. it's got several others. But those those two, you know, specifically for Western hunters, I think will will uh, go a long way in terms of your knowledge of, uh, on these animals. And, and it it helps. I mean, it helps tremendously. So, um, now this is... You know, when this is... A not just and not just people out west. I mean, you got to understand, we got a lot of people out uh, on the eastern and middle part of the U.S. that come out west to go hunting. We do. You, you know, these are things that they these are things that they can do as well to you know expand that knowledge and and I mean you know now el you know elk populations growing and starting to thrive in Kentucky and Pennsylvania and and I mean just expanding you know over there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, any anybody that it doesn't matter whether it's elk hunting or deer hunting. If you're fanatical about, you know, pronghorn antelope, whatever it is, 
get your hands on information and learn as much as you can about, you know, what you're, what you're chasing. Yeah. Yeah. Totally agree. I couldn't agree more that, that to me, to me, uh, in, in my mind, what, what has made me a much better hunter over the years is knowing the animals more so than anything else. And, and I think you do, if you, if you're going to be in a, a September archery elk hunter, you really do need to call, but you can also, we were talking about watching videos. Have you seen Randy mm-hmm. Newberg's videos, fresh tracks are out hunting elk in September, man, the guy is a terrible caller, but he still calls in elk, you, you know? And, and, mm-hmm. and so it's, it's not about sounding like you're at the, you know, Rocky mountain elk foundation competition, um, it, it's, mm-hmm. it's about knowing how to vocalize back. And that's what Randy understands. He knows those animals. He knows their nature, just like you, you, you understand the behavioral yep. nuances of that particular animal. And that's why you can, you could vocalize to him and call him right into bow range. And, and that's, that's the difference. And so for, for me, um, I, I think that that is, that is one of the, the, the secrets to success that a lot of hunters don't put enough time into is understanding the animal uh, knowing their behavior, their, their biology, you know, what they eat, what they, what they, right. when they breed, when they drop their antlers, when they bachelor up, when they, when they break out of those bachelor groups, when, the, when the cows herd up and when, when they go to their winter range, all those things, when you put it all together, like a puzzle hunting season becomes a part of that puzzle piece. And, and it really helps you laser focus in on what you're hunting and, 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 uh, definitely, um, it's you just you you will only benefit yourself by knowing that and i know we kind of got off topic of of uh the whole goal setting thing but <laughs> but actually but, but actually i was going to say you know those are all parts of how you're going to accomplish that goal for sure you yep. know how you're, how you're going to get that it's it's just pieces that a lot of people overlook and and, and so but it's 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 all tied together and that's really just supporting what we've been talking about where you have your overall large goal, then you break that down into subcategories, then those subcategories, then you start breaking down how you're going to obtain each of those categories, how you're going to hit each of those marks so that you can ultimately reach that top of the mountain goal that you have. Mm -hmm. Yep. This has all been uh, really good stuff. I think uh, folks are going to get a lot out of this conversation, Michael. So I, I really appreciate it. Um, mm-hmm. Let's let's kind of wrap this up by telling everybody, uh, you know, where they can find Elk Calling Academy, Sawtooth Outdoors, uh, you, you know, all that kind of sure. stuff. It's I, I think uh, it'll be good. Uh, I, I I highly personally I highly recommend the Elk Calling Academy. So tell us where where you can find us or folks can find you. You bet. So- so Elk Calling Academy, you can find it on Facebook, Instagram, uh, YouTube, and recently TikTok. So um, everything oh is is under Elk. TikTok. Yeah. Uh, you got like your, you. I, I know you're famous for hunting in your bedazzled jeans uh, based on our last <laughs> conversation. So now you're even TikToking, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I haven't, you, you know, um, there's only two videos on there and it's basically just kind of some, some iPhone videos that took pictures together and put them in slideshows. But, but yeah, each, each of the places is just elk calling Academy. Um, you can also go to elk calling and that's going to take you to the Patreon page. Um, it is a paid membership. You have two options. You can either pay $15 a month or you can pay an annual, annual fee of 150. That if you take the annual option, it basically gets you two months free. Um, but I think I posted a screenshot the other day and I think there's 26, um, you know, calling tutorial videos. Um, mm-hmm. you know, I want to say there's, there's 26 or 30 live Q and A's. And that's the, that's the one thing at elkcallingacademy.com is every two weeks I do a live Q and A session only for those herd members that you, you can't find this any place else. Those videos are only on that page. Um, and that's going to continue. So, 
part of the part of the membership is you're not only getting access to the tutorial videos, you're getting access to the live Q&A videos, you're getting access to articles, um, you're also getting access to discount codes with brand partner deals. Um, but you get those live Q&As every two weeks to where you can um you know, ask questions and run scenarios and talk about those things. And then, you know, again, I offer the one-on-one -on -one lessons that are $30 per hour. But if you're a herd member on the Patreon page, you get them for 25 bucks an hour. So you get a little bit of a discount on that. So, and, and one, one thing I would recommend with, with people, let's, for, for a lot of you that are, that are listening to this going into this season being like your first or second season, and you want to be a really good elk caller, one way to really get a jump start on that and, and get you pointed in the right direction is jump on uh, like one or two private lessons with Michael and, and then, you know, carry that on with the, with the herd membership on, on the Patreon page. Uh, but, but those, those initial private one-on-one -on -one lessons are going to be dynamite for you. Um, that's basically a, a Facebook page right now. And that's what we're going to keep it as, as a Facebook page for interaction. But the one thing we're going to have on that is we are going to have a private field testers group within that, that again, it'll be a monthly subscription into that field testers. Um, kind of what I've been playing around with is a couple of different levels, but say one level, it's $24.99 a month, but you're going to get $50 worth of gear each year or, or each month for you to test and then come back into the group and talk about the gear, what you liked about it, what you didn't like, what changes you would like to see, um, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And, and with it being Sawtooth Outdoor Supply, I mean, it's going to encompass camping, it's going to encompass fishing, survival, and it, and it may not just be physical goods. It could be digital goods. You know, it could be a, you know, survival shelter ebook mm -hmm. or survival shelter pamphlet or, you know, it's going to be a mix of things that's going to step up and, and give you the tools that you need out there. Um, for survival or woodsmanship or to enhance, you know, the camping experience. Yeah. 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 No, that's great. I I'm excited about that. Actually, I'm, I'm super excited about that. Um, so, so th there you have it <clears throat> folks, uh, with the elk calling Academy. Um, I'm really excited for that website to go live. That'll be, that'll be a really cool thing. Um, and, and, you know, I just, I, I've, I've really enjoyed kind of watching you, uh, build this brand, the Elk Calling Academy, and, and it's grown. And, and uh, I, I get tons of, res uh, or, or I'm sorry, messages or emails or whatever, you know, people write in and they're saying, you know, let's get Michael Batiste back on and, and we'd love to hear from him again. So that's, that's always a good sign. And uh, it, this is, this is, are you still running all the Scree gear? Yes, absolutely. Scree is, and, Scree is one of my brand partners. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and they sponsor this show and, and, uh, that's thanks to you for introducing me to them. Um, so in fact, you speaking know, of screen gear, speaking of screen gear, now that they made the post, have you, have you announced to everybody about the, uh, uh, late season pattern that they're coming out with? that's going to be targeted for elk and deer hunters. And you know, I haven't, I have not announced it, so we can do that right now if you want. Oh, well, I think we just kind of did. So, yeah, yeah. Well, that's <laughs> going to be pretty stellar. It actually, it bounces out pretty nicely because I was, I was actually, and I, I emailed Josh over at Scree, uh, when, when they announced they were kind of doing away with the mountain stealth pat pattern. I'm like, man, that is my pattern, man. That's, that's <laughs> what I use. And, and I really love this stuff. And, and now you're kind of discontinuing it. And he says, Oh, no, 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 no. Don't you worry. Yeah, we have yeah. we have a new pattern coming out that's going to kind of replace that, and uh, it's yeah. it's trust me, it's it's worth it. So I'm I'm a big fan of Scree. Yeah, so so for those of you that are Scree fans or haven't heard from them, you know, definitely check them out and stay tuned. A um, lot of exciting things coming. You know, this puts us in an interesting dynamic. Who do we say, uh, you know, to use the code? Do you, we use the Elk Calling Academy code or do we use the Western Huntsman code at this point? I mean. What a, what a you dilemma. Know, my, the, the code, the, 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 you, you can go ahead and put your code out because the code that I have is only for herd members because it's, it's a little deeper discount. So, oh, nice. um, 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, kind of a All dangle right. a carrot, kind of dangle a carrot there as 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 an advantage of uh, becoming a herd member at Elk Calling Academy there. Good deal. I like that. That's that's a good incentive. So, um, and and guys, like I say, and 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 you've heard it in the ad that I run halfway through the show every time. Uh, that that scree gear um, is just it's one of those things. Like if if you want to get into the high grade technical hunting apparel without dropping, uh, you know, a small fortune or mortgaging your your house uh, or selling one of your children, uh, scree is the way to go. <laughs> it, it is it is Absolutely. it's going to be be that uh, that gear for you so michael uh this has been a lot of fun i appreciate you coming on man um it's always great that you know you're always so willing to come on the show and teach and and educate people on on this uh this crazy life uh (laughs) adventure of elk hunting uh that we love so much so i I just appreciate you coming on and and uh, look forward to doing it again as always Oh, absolutely. It's always, always an honor to come on and, and always have fun sitting down and talking with you. Good deal. We'll, uh, we'll talk soon. All right. Have a good one. You made it all the way to the end. Thank you so much for tuning into the show. We sure appreciate your support. This is Jim Huntsman signing off and reminding you to check us out at Instagram at The Western Huntsman and on Facebook at The Western Huntsman. And you can also check out the website at thewesternhuntsman.com. Thanks again. We'll see you guys next time. Stay Western, and I'll see you on the mountain.